Okay. Okay, we got one more person to admit. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for joining us for today's a month of service presentation of maintaining and adding value to your home. My name is Nia Murray. I am programs coordinator with Neighborhood Recovery Community Development Corporation, and we are I we are one of the partners in the month of service collaboration. Also included is the City of Houston's Department of Neighborhoods, and joining us today is Ms. Myra Hippolyte. Uh, also included in the partnership is Lone Star Legal Aid, the Earl Carl Institute. Um, we got more people coming in. Um, Harris County Appraisal District, Houston Bar Association, and Houston Volunteer Lawyers. And together we make up a month of service. And what a month of service is, is a collaboration of these eight different organizations that come together on a monthly basis to offer a variety of workshops uh, relative to asset building, asset protection, uh, and maintaining of generational wealth and community empowerment. Uh, so today's presentation, we're going to be talking about uh, maintaining and adding value to your home. Um, so we've got our inspector. I see uh, Brian just joined us uh, for today. To um, uh, He's a licensed re residential inspector with Smooth Smith Group Property Inspections. And also uh, joining us is Miss Nikki uh, Collins with Keys Real Estate Services, who's going to be our presenters for today. Um, so basically what we're gonna be talking about today is giving you some little tips and information uh, about maintaining and the longevity of your home, little basic maintenance tips that you can, you can do. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we know uh, a lot of folks are, are renovating and adding things to their home, but not necessarily uh, adding value to their homes. So, uh, so Ms. Nikki's gonna kind of give you guys some information about what actually adds value to your home. Uh, monetarily and uh, personally. So, so there's, there's a difference there. She had to explain that to me, uh, you know, just because it doesn't add dollars to the value, it's still, you know, a value to you. So um, with that being said, uh, information that we do present here today is for educational purposes. Um, however, if you do feel yourself in need of personal more detail one-on-one, -on -one, then we encourage you to reach out to the presenters in addition to that, just wanted you to be aware that the session is being recorded as well as being broadcast live on our social media platform at, uh, on, on Facebook at Amos Houston TX. So uh, we uh, encourage you guys to be as interactive as you'd like to be. Feel free to ask whatever questions that you have, but do please keep that in mind that it is being recorded and being broadcast live. So we ask that you try to keep your questions as general as you possibly can without giving any personal detailed information for everybody to uh, actually access and have info and have access to. So uh, with that being said, we'd like to go ahead and introduce our uh, uh, Ms. Myra and uh, we'll introduce the presenters and we'll move right on in. I know Brian's probably out on a job right now. So we'll probably start out with the maintenance part first and then go on into the appraisal part. So uh, Ms. Myra. Thank you, Ms. Nia. Good morning, Ms. Nikki. And good morning, Mr. Brian. Uh, my name is Myra Hippolyte and I work with the city of Houston Department of Neighborhoods, Office of Neighborhood Engagement under the direction of Division Manager Paul Green. On behalf of Mayor Sylvester Turner and Director Takasha Francis, we want to welcome you to the Month of Service Program. The Month of Service Program is all about giving back free information to the Houston Harris County State of Texas uh, community. Come to find out, we even have some uh, community members that are from out of the United States. So welcome to you guys also. Um, the month of service is about giving you free information that whenever you're going through a stressor in your life, and sometimes when you're not going through a stressor in your life, something, you know, it, this information could also be good at all the time. Um, it's, it's, it gives you enough information that when you got to make decisions about your life, your home, your well-being, you have all the information in front of you and a team of partners that can assist you through the process. You know, it's like when you're learning how to swim, you know, you first start paddling and then you start kicking your feet and then you start swaying your arms and then you actually start, you know, uh, floating uh, and then you start swimming step by step. That's what the month of service is all about. It's about giving you free information step by step so that eventually you can learn how to swim on your own. Swim through the process, through, swim through your stressors in life and, and just keep smiling and keep shooting for the stars. Now, I do wanna say a personal note about today's uh, program. 
I, as most of you know, I am, I protest, my husband and I protest are the appraisal of our home every year. Uh, but Miss Nikki and Mr. Brian have some great information that can assist you when you're actually going through the protest process, what will help you, what looks, what is important for you to note in your protest. And uh, because Miss Nikki, uh, thank you, ma'am. Um, she gave me a lot of hints and told me what to say, what not to say, what to use to make it look more uh, understandable. So thanks, Miss Nikki, for all your help. And I'm sure she will be able to assist you uh, when it comes to going through the protest process, meeting with the uh, appraisal board, and then maybe arbitration. Thanks everyone, have a great day. Okay, Nikki, why don't we go ahead and have you introduce yourself and then Brian can introduce and move right on into his presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nikki Collins. I'm a certified general appraiser here in the state of Texas. Um, I've been a real estate appraiser for 18 years. I started when I was three and I'm a second generation. My family is um, a family of real estate professionals. So thank you. Okay, Brian. You're on mute. All right. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Brian Smith. I am a licensed professional property inspector here in the state of Texas, also a licensed termite inspector, uh, originally an electrical engineer before I got into inspecting properties. Um, I inspect commercial properties as well as residential. And i um, looking forward to sharing some information with you all today that I, I think will be valuable. Um, Ms. Nia, can you, are you, can you share the- uh, I sure the can, hold on just a second. Yep. Like Ms. Nia mentioned, I'm, I'm out in the, I'm actually at a property doing an inspection right now. It's a, it's a new construction property up in Porter. Uh, Y'all aren't familiar with Porter. It's uh, north side of town, a little bit north of Kingwood here. And so, uh, so what I want to what I want to talk to you all about today is general maintenance of the home. And when we start talking about adding value to the home, um, there's there's a part of the of the process where we add value, but there's another part where we maintain the value of our home. And and I, I like to think about maintenance as maintaining the value of the home. There's things that you can do to, to add value, but you also wanna make sure that you are maintaining your property properly because our, our properties, our homes are, are the, one of the biggest investments that we can make in our lifetime. And so what I've shared with Ms. Nia and, um, and this will be distributed to everyone is a maintenance checklist. And this checklist is divided up into a couple of categories. There's some, there's some items here that are specific to the springtime of the year. There's some items that are particular to fall. There's some monthly items and there's some yearly items. And so with that being said, um, what I wanna- Can everyone I'll, see that? Can everyone see? Yes. I'll, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'll take that as a yes that everyone okay. can see it. And so, with that being said, um, I, I'm not going to read every single line item on there, but I, I just want to I just want to kind of hit some of the major um, items in a home because when you get this, you'll be able to see here in detail the things that should be done in the springtime, some things that should be done in the fall monthly and annually. But what I wanna talk about is the five major systems of a home. I call them, I like to call them the, the big five. And in the big five, what we have is, we have our air conditioning, our HVAC system. Uh, we have our foundation of our home. We have the roof of our home. We have our electrical and we have our plumbing system. So 
these are five of the major items of a home. Again, your HVAC, air conditioner, furnace, the foundation of your home, the roof, your electrical system and your plumbing system. Now there's other parts and pieces of a home, but we're just gonna talk about those five briefly. And at a high level, some things that we can do to make sure that we're maintaining our home properly. So I will start with the foundation of the home. So here, here in Houston, um, we're experiencing quite a bit of a heat wave going on here and it, it's really, really hot. And a couple of things with the foundation that I wanna mention is in these, in these conditions, um, we want to make sure that our, our foundation, that there's, we have, we have moisture. We, we wanna make sure that our, our foundation area is irrigated. If you have a sprinkler system, now I'm not talking about um, standing water close to the foundation, cause that could have a, a, an adverse effect. But what we don't want, we want moderation. We don't want the, the soil and the ground to get too dry around our foundation to where um, the, we, we start having movement from the foundation not being, um, not being moist. And the reason why I say that is because we have, we have very uh, clay type soil here in the Houston area. So normally our general rains are good enough, but if we're experiencing a bit of a heat wave, it's not a bad idea to, if you don't have a sprinkler system, just, you know, if it's been over a week since we've had any rain, just take your water hose and walk around your, your house and just give it a little bit of water. Again, I'm not talking about um, completely drenching the foundation and nor, nor does it have to be done every day, but we just wanna make sure that our foundation is irrigated a little bit. Also, as far as our foundation goes, um, the corners of our foundation, those can be the, the weakest area of the foundation and, and those can develop um, little small cracks on the foundation. And those can be an entry point for moisture, pest intrusion. They sell, they sell a concrete sealer at Home Depot. You can put a little water with that and um, take a putty knife and, and smear it over that. And, and just keep your foundation, um, keep your foundation in good shape. We want to keep the water away from it, um, standing water. And, and so just at a high level, a foundation doesn't require a ton of maintenance, but um, we don't want standing water. We don't want it to be too dry. Now, the next section that I want to talk about is our roof. And I'll keep this part pretty short and straight to the point. Um, a roof does require maintenance as well. For a lot of people, the roof of their house is just kind of out of sight, out of mind. And I'd normally recommend at least once every other year, you have a licensed, honest roofer take a look at your roof and what they'll do, they, they offer what's called a tune-up on your roof, similar to the verbiage used for a car. And in, in this tune-up, normally we're talking maybe $300. They will check your roof and make sure that any kind of uplifted flashings or shingles are laid down appropriately, that you don't have any type of water leaks that you aren't aware of. And so, we get a lot of rain and weather events here in the Houston area. And so I think uh, a tune-up at least every other year, if not once a year, is, a, is not a bad idea for making sure that your roof is in good order. The average lifespan is about 20 years on the roof and doing some maintenance, you can, you can, get, you can get a lot of life out of your roof if you're, if you're very intentional. Also, you want to keep your tree limbs trimmed back so you don't have tree limbs that are touching the roof. Um, this can shorten the lifespan of the roof by those tree branches uh, waving back and forth and, and brushing against the roof. This can cause damage and keeping pine needles and things like that cleared off of the roof. These are helpful. Keeping your gutters cleaned out. If you have gutters on the house, you want to keep those clear because you don't want to get moisture intrusion at your roof line. So these are, these are a handful of things that you can do to make sure that you keep your roof in good working order. Because to replace a roof, 
you could easily be talking about eight, ten thousand dollars or more. And that's not something that you want to be paying if you could just do some maintenance on it and, and get extra life out of your roof. The next section that I'll talk about is our HVAC, our air conditioner, which we, we desperately need here in the Houston area. We desperately need our air conditioner. And at a high level, what we want to do is at least once a year, you should have a licensed HVAC technician, air conditioner technician, come out and service your unit. Normally, they charge maybe $150, you know, $175 to come out. And what they'll do, they will check the Freon level, make sure there's nothing leaking, clean the evaporator coil, clean the condensation drain. And this is just a really good idea because air conditioner units can be expensive. Again, you're talking $5,000, $8,000 or more to replace an air conditioner unit. And one of the most common things that I see as a home inspector is people don't do the maintenance on those units. And that can really shorten the lifespan of your air conditioner unit. Now, there's some, there's some DIY tips that are on the checklist. There's a, there's a drain line in the, in the attic where you can pour a little bleach or vinegar in that um, periodically to make sure that that line stays clear. Uh, but at a high level, you want to make sure that that unit is serviced at least once a year. Okay. Uh, the next section that I'll talk about is electrical. And in the electrical section, oh, and I also forgot to mention on, on HVAC, change your air filters, please. Um, depending on what type of, what your lifestyle is, if you got pets or, you know, I mean, if, if there's a lot of dust for whatever reason in your house, that is another easy maintenance item that you can do to make sure that your air conditioner unit is performing well and you get all the life out of it. So change your air conditioner filters, okay? Uh, next, we'll talk electrical. We'll talk electrical. So on electrical, um, basically what we wanna do here in the electrical section, I will, I, I, I like to group smoke detectors into the electrical system. For, from a safety standpoint, we wanna make sure that we've got fresh batteries in our smoke detectors. If you ever start to see your smoke detector start to turn a yellow looking color, that's a visual indicator that the smoke detector is beyond its recommended service life. So smoke detectors are very important. And we wanna make sure that our electrical outlets are, are in good working condition. We wanna make sure that the the covers are on the electrical outlets. We don't have exposed wires, things like that happening at the electrical unit. And, um, and, and at a high level, um, there's, there's, there's normally not a lot of electrical work that's expected of a homeowner, but um, in general, you just wanna make sure you keep things clean and clear. Um, you don't wanna start plugging in a lot of extension cords and, and overworking uh, electrical outlets and having things overheated, things like that, um, space heaters and things like that. So just, uh, just be mindful of the load that you're putting on your house. And finally, I will talk about the plumbing system of your home, the plumbing system of your home. So here in the, in the plumbing se section, I'll talk about showers, for example. Showers are a very high moisture area. And in the shower area, you want to make sure that the grout and seal it at the, at the shower tiles, that you maintain those areas. Because what you don't want is moisture intrusion getting behind the walls of your shower area and causing mildew, mold type issues. So you want to make sure that you, you keep up with the caulking and things like that of the home. Also, a lot of times you're, um, I see a lot of toilets that will get loose. They're supposed to be anchored to the, to the floor securely. And you want to make sure, this is an easy fix. If your toilet becomes loose, you know, you can get 
you can get a, a pretty simple tool, um, a, a little a little socket, and you can tighten you can tighten your toilet back securely to the floor. And the reason why is because whenever that toilet gets loose and it starts moving around, you don't want to develop a water leak at the base of your toilet unnecessarily because of movement that can be prevented. So those are a couple of things. Um, also, you wanna make sure that you know where your main water shutoff valve is to your home. Now, normally there's two. There's one at the water meter, and then there's normally another one. It's either on the side of your house. Sometimes they're in the garage. But what we learned in the freeze a couple of years ago is that a lot of people do not know where to turn the water off to their home. And that's very important. If, if we do end up getting another freeze situation, you wanna make sure that you know how to turn the water off to your home um, in, in case of, in case of a, a, a problem. So um, at a high level, I just wanna end with saying this. Um, we work very hard to purchase our homes and, and it's just a really good idea to take care of your investment. If you go to, to sell your home, you wanna make sure that you get top dollar for your home. And one of the best ways to do that is to keep things clean and keep up with your maintenance. If something breaks, the best way to do it is get it fixed right away. So maintaining your home is a good way to maintain your investment and, um, and, and get top dollar if you go to sell it or you know, keep the value of your home up. And at, with that being said, I guess that's uh, that's basically what I have. Um, again, there's a, there's a list of items here that Ms. Mia has available that she will distribute to everyone. My contact information is, uh, is there on the flyer. If you ever need home inspection services, I'm always available and more than happy to help. And if anyone has any questions about anything, I, I, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, we can go to some questions now if anybody has any, because I know that you have to get back to your inspection and you won't be available at the end. So if there's right. anybody that has any uh, maintenance um, inspection type questions or what have you, Mr. Smith, please feel free to either type it into the chat or unmute yourself uh, and you can ask your question directly of him. So. Um, cost, would, can you kind of touch on like the cost? If people don't do these basic maintenance things, you know, like change, what, what, did, what would it cost them if they're not, uh, you know, maintaining or putting that caulk around the shower and they have that moisture and, and mold and mildew that comes into the back of, of their walls yeah. of the shower. If, if they're not caulking their windows and what does that do for, the, the the cost that that you know that could potentially affect the homeowner yeah so you you could easily be talking about thousands of dollars in repairs versus just a few dollars 10 20 dollars buying the tube of caulk because once you start talking about getting moisture intrusion in behind walls and things like that that can get very expensive very fast uh, because there's there's demolition costs, there's rebuilding costs. And so um, you just wanna make sure that you spend a little bit of time and a little bit of money now versus spending a lot of money later. Same with your air conditioner. Um, you know, you can spend $150 once a year or you can be in a position where you're spending thousands of dollars to replace a unit prematurely when, I mean, it can be easily avoided. Changing your filters on your air conditioner, getting in service, you can save yourself a lot of money in the long run by just spending a little time, little effort to maintain the, your house in a, in a good way. Okay. All right, well. Brian, thank you very much for, for, for taking the time out and uh, for, for stopping in the middle of your inspection to actually uh, present this information. Uh, and I will definitely share the uh, maintenance tips or that maintenance checklist with, uh, with everyone um, 
uh, that have registered here for today. And in the meantime, if there are any questions, please feel free to still go ahead and type them into the chat. Um, and we could see if we could do our best to either answer or forward them to you so that you can uh, address them for, for the participants directly. You bet. And I want to say thank you, Ms. Nia, for having me. I always, always enjoy uh, being able to been able to help out whenever asked. And um, thank you for having me. Well, thank you. All right, Ms. Ms. Nikki, you're available. You, you up? Yes, ma'am. I'm here. All right. Thank you, Brian. All right. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Nikki Collins. Um, Certified General Real Estate Appraiser. There we go. Um, I'm a second generation real estate professional. My I, my background is in IT. I came out in the middle of the dot-com crash and I was like, well, let's learn something new. And so I became a real estate professional. Got my master's degree in real estate from Texas A&M um, a few years ago. So when we are talking about um, value creation, value adding in real estate. Um, everything in, in investment of any kind is about the return. It's about the return on the investment. Re return on investment talks about how much did I put in and based on what I put in, how much more will I get out? So we're going to talk about return on investment. We're going to talk about cost versus value. What I pay for something does not always equate to its value. We're going to talk about pecuniary value, which is the value of an item in dollars and cents, purely monetary value. There we go. And then we'll talk about personal value, which is the value that is emotional. It is intrinsic. I can't really express that in terms of dollars. It is just what something is worth to me. So when we talk about return on investment, it measures the profits you have made or could have made on an investment. So it says, if I buy a car and I put leather seats in, y'all know car is a bad example because you know it's a waste and asset, but let's pretend. So if I put leather seats in this car, and I go to sell it, will that earn me more in the, the selling price than I would have gotten if I had had cloth seats? So, you know, we can, we can kind of see it because, you know, we feel, most people feel like leather seats are worth more than cloth seats. Now let's talk about in homes, in your real estate property, because a lot of times, we also make decisions about what we feel like we should get a return from based on the work we should do. And the problem with that is when a real estate appraiser comes out that we have no feelings. We have no feelings at all. It is literally a piece of dirt with sticks and bricks on it. And we're gonna tell you what that dirt, the sticks and the bricks are worth. We have no skin in the game. And so we, we, we recently had, um, our office recently had a review come back in. I thought it was cute. And the reviewer asked, well, why is there such a difference between the uh, contract price and the appraised value? And I really wanted to say, well, there was no appraiser in on the negotiation. When you are negotiating price, and notice I said value, I mean, we, notice I did not say value, I said price. You have contract price. What you have is two people who, especially in the purchases of homes, are emotionally invested in that purchase, right? The seller, if it's not an investor seller, the seller has lived in that home and I raised my children here. And, you know, look at that wallpaper. I remember what made me put that wallpaper up. That's when our first baby was born. And so because of the emotional attachments, you feel like the house should be worth insert a number. Well, the buyer is on the other side with dreams of things in their heads, right? I imagine that I could bring my child. I imagine the Thanksgiving dinners. I imagine. And so those things that are in me, I try, you know, I feel like those things are worth more. But the return and investment is a mathematical equation. 
It does not consider feelings. It does not consider emotions. It does not consider imaginations. It is purely financial. It says, this is what you put in. This is how much you can get out. This is the percentage of increase or decrease because sometimes you will find a negative return of investment. And, and that's why I put up the picture of the pool. We live in Texas. Now, our hearts and minds say, particularly in this time of year, when you ask Google what the temperature is, and he says it's 99 degrees, but because of the humidity, it feels like a million. So in our hearts and in our, you know, in our hearts, we say, it, surely everyone wants a pool, right? Now, as an appraiser and a pool owner, here's what I know. I know that um, you have maintenance costs for a pool. I know that your insurance is higher for a pool. I know that if somebody walks into if somebody walks into my backyard because they were trying to case the joint and rob the place, they fall into my pool and drown. Their family can sue me and they would win. See, so the pool is a liability for all of the good things that it gives us in the heat. So we will tell people often that unless you plan to stay for quite some time, do not put in a pool expecting to get an equal return on investment because you won't get it. So then we talk about timing, right? That leads us straight to timing. How long will you own this property? Is it your homestead property? Are you going to be living, it there, living there yourself or are you going to be investing? Will you have the opportunity to enjoy the changes and the modifications that you are making? If I'm going to live, um, if I'm going to be living in, in, in a home that I put a pool in, right? And I'm going to be enjoying that pool. My family is going to enjoy that pool. I want to, I want to feel as if when I when I go into my backyard, I have gone on vacation, right? And so if I sit down and I say, okay, for my vacations, I spend, I don't know, because I haven't gone anywhere in two years. But for my vacations, I spend five thousand dollars to take to take my family on vacation. Well, this pool will cost me twenty five, thirty thousand dollars to put in, and that is not what they are really costing for an oasis pool at this point. But it's going to cost me thirty thousand dollars to put in. So I say, okay. So if we're not going to vacation because the world is falling apart, you know, pandemic wise. How many years will it take me to feel like I've gotten the value for my pool? And so that's why that's how we look at how long will you own the property? If if what is common in the area is granite, but I want Carrera marble, how long will I be here to enjoy that? Now, on the flip side, I'm not planning to live in this house. It is purely an investment property. With now we're looking at what does the market need in order to feel like this property is updated? If you're living in an area where you have higher grade carpet and ceramic tile or luxury vinyl plank, I would not advise you to put down um, sheet vinyl flooring because you're just not going to see that return in terms of the investment. A renter won't pay as much because they'll be looking for those things that are normal in the area. So if I am not going to enjoy the fruits of my labor, and this doesn't say that if you're not living there, put in crap things, you know, put in things that really are, are lower value. It doesn't say that. It's just saying to be mindful that you are not, if you're preparing to sell your home, be mindful that you are not living there. Don't make choices based on how you feel, but rather than what the market says you will get for the choices that you make. Okay, let's see. So deferred maintenance versus capital improvement. I think it is excellent that on these, on these meetings that they pair an appraiser and an inspector because really they go hand in hand. Um, when he talked about the maintenance of your home, that is just as important in terms of your home's value as it is to add or remodel or to renovate. Because when you talk about routine actions that help you to keep your asset, oh, look at that typo, your asset in its original, in its original condition, doing that thing, those things, um, the replacement of a roof. Yes, we count that as a good thing, but 
we count it as much worse if the if the roof is in bad shape and nothing was done. Um, when you when you come in and you can tell that there's been no painting in years, that there's been no um, if we can see that that the foundation needed repair and didn't get repair, we don't charge you for a repaired foundation. When I say charge you, we do something in appraisal where, that we call adjustments, and we either adjust up or down depending on um, you know whether what you have is a is is better or worse than the sales that we are comparing you to. And a lot of times people will say, well, I didn't get the foundation repaired because I didn't want you to think that something is wrong with the foundation. Well, as an appraiser, though we are not um, a foundation specialist, we know how to cite when there are foundation problems. And we would much rather see, um, see a crack where you may not have fixed the sheetrock but when we look outside, we can see where aligned with that crack, there was a repair. So we assume, then we make an assumption that you had the repair done, that that repair is warranted. So even though you may have to do a little patch up work inside of the house, the big thing that would have been the big adjustment had already been taken care of. So you do all of those things that try to help you keep it into its original condition so that you don't get a negative mark for condition. So then we talk about capital improvements. Those are investments that you make that can increase your value. Things like um, if we, uh, the home I live in was built in 1982. So of course it was like the fancy Formica, you know, that linoleum was, you could skate on the linoleum in your socks. And that was like really nice <laughs> in 1982, but it would never fly in 2022. And so over the years, what we have done is we have made capital improvements little by little that kept it current with the time um, that we're in. In fact, we made one set of improvements last year to the downstairs and we're making another set to the improvements upstairs, just trying to keep it in, in line with what's happening in the market. Sometimes it's good to just go out and you know pretend at the new home um, subdivisions and see what they're doing. Because if you see what they're doing in new homes, that's the current trend. And so it gives you an idea of, of what's happening. And if I were to make a change to my home, these might be good changes to make. So we wanna think like a buyer. If you're preparing to sell, think like a buyer. So what would you look for when you were buying a home? In fact, typically, if you're selling, you already are thinking about thinking like a buyer for your next home. What things are you looking for in your next home in terms of finishes, in terms of updating, in terms of style? Um, and you don't want to you don't want to do it where you're thinking about your you in particular, because I am a very small segment of the market. I am an infinitesimally small segment of the market. I really like, um, I like purples and <laughs> blues, you know, rich, deep purples and blues. But if I were selling my house, there's no way that that aubergine that I like on the wall for myself that I would leave if I were preparing to sell it because I know that someone will walk in and they will see the accent wall that I adore, but they will see the need to hire someone to come in and paint it. It is much better to do a, a super neutral palette. And um, then you, you have the ability to attract a much larger segment of the market. When we were talking early about the, the, the granite and the Carrera marble, one of those is a granite, one of those is a Carrera marble on the screen. Now, I put them up there. And so I think I know which one is the granite and which one is the Carrera marble. But in all honesty, it wouldn't make that big a difference to me, except marble takes a whole lot more to take care of than granite. And so for me, and because I am not a luxury market purchaser, I would not want Carrera marble. Now, in the, when you get into some of the luxury markets, you know, there are things that you do over there that's way different than what the rest of us do. But um, you, want, you want to be mindful of the choices you're making. You don't want to 
what we call over improve for the market. You know, sometimes we'll say, oh, we'll make this really luxurious. Well, but if your area is not really luxurious, then you may be doing more than you would have to do. By the same token, if your area is really luxurious, then you need to do a little more than the, than the average um, seller would do because your buyer is going to be expecting more. And then we want you to think about an appraiser. So think, think like an appraiser. What's happening in the area around me? What things, that's why we say go visit the, the, the new home, um, the new construction homes to see what they're doing. Um, what things are considered to kind of be the baseline for the area right now? Um, is, it, is it better to do, to do more or to do better quality versus quantity? And am I over improving or not doing enough? It is about find real estate is all about finding the balance that will help you spend the least to make the most. That's your goal. How little do I have to spend to have great impact? Typically, what we think is if I spend a whole lot, I'll get a whole lot. But that's very seldom the rule. Very most often what you want to do is to do do the least you can, but that's going to have big impact and provide you a larger return. And then how to move the needle. If you only have a certain amount of money to make and to, to put into um, remodeling, updating, um, modifying your home, where should you spend it? Anyone in real estate will tell you that kitchens and bathrooms sell homes. And so if you were going to spend money, that would be where you would spend it. Of course, you want to do things like make sure the paint is nice, make sure that, that carpets are clean. Sometimes a clean carpet, you know, will do just as much as replacing a carpet, particularly if there's no smoke smells or, you know, pet smells or that kind of thing. Sometimes just having somebody come in and, and steam clean that thing will do just as much as if you were to replace it all. And then that will give you some more money to do things like new toilets or new tile and showers, you know, because those things are the things we typically walk into a home and we go straight to the kitchen. At least women do, I think. I do. I don't know. I do for sure. But, you know, kitchens wow me. Bathrooms wow me which I think is nuts because we really don't spend as much time in a bathroom as you would think from how we buy homes, but they're important. And then we talked a little earlier about pooling or not pooling. I'm a fan of pools, but I will tell you they don't make the difference that you would think in a real estate appraisal report. And then in floor and decor, that's back to the aubergine walls about making decor cho choices that are... Um, suitable for a large market, not just um, my, my personal aesthetic choices. And then if you are preparing to make changes, make a plan, know what you want to do, as opposed to um, doing what I typically do, which is I get what I call, ooh, moments. And I'm like, ooh, I should, ooh, look at that. Ooh, maybe if... And if you want to stay within your budget and not go too far, not do too much, make sure you do enough, make a plan, write it down, say, if I were to make changes, I would make these changes. And then from there, you say the most important changes are these, you know, if, you know, if I, I will absolutely do these things because these things are within my budget. If I get a little more budget or there's budget left over, then I'll do these things. And then these are things that I'd like to do, but if I don't, it won't be a big deal. And you wanna be honest about how much you can spend. You wanna be honest about what, what level of return is important to you. And you wanna be specific. Don't just say things like, um, I wanna fix the kitchen. You know, you wanna say, I'm, I'm gonna replace the countertops. I want to add a backsplash. You know, the, the appliances need upgrading and you'll want to say which appliances. You want to be as specific as you can because it will help to kind of give you um, the framework for what it is you're trying to do. And whatever you do, don't overextend. As wonderful as it is to make the modifications, to make the upgrades, to, to make the, the renovation, do not do what you cannot afford to do. Do not do what you cannot afford to lose because there's no guarantee 
that you will get the return that you are looking for. So if you cannot afford for it to go out, it's like loaning money. If you can't afford for it to go out and not come back, don't do it. And that's it. So if you need to contact me, there is my cell phone number. There is my email address. I'm available to answer questions that you have. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Nikki. Um, today's presentation went a little bit faster than we normally do. I'm, I'm trying to tell why. you, look, I had to look at my watch just now. I was <laughs> like, I feel like I flew. <laughs> yeah. So if there are any questions of any of the participants, feel, please feel free to uh, to to either to chime in or um, type your question into the chat. Uh, I'm looking back through the registration to see if there were any questions when people registered also. Uh, do, 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 do. Is there any information that you could share in regards to uh, when Myra was talking about the property tax protest, like what information would they be, uh, would they get from you that could assist them with protesting their property taxes? So let me be very honest about this season's property protest, I um, mean, property uh, tax protest season. Um, I would say, in my opinion, that this one is going to be very different than what we have seen in years past. And it will be different largely because of the record growth that we have, I mean, realized and seen in the real estate markets. Most times, an appraiser has been able to go back and pull comparables that will show you know, that have been, that will be able to definitively show overvaluation. And what we are finding now was because of this great free-for-all in the real estate market, sometimes the comps are not there to, you know, that, that'll, that will show, you know, easy, easily. And so what we are telling clients now is we are saying, let's look at, as opposed to looking at what the market is doing, Let's look, which is typically how we do it. We go from market to your home. We're going to go from home to your market. Um, if there are deferred maintenance items that you haven't kept up with, let's talk to the appraisal district about that. If what is common in your area are um, different types of, of updating and renovations and those kind of things that you have not yet done, let's talk about those things to the appraisal district. Um, it's that you know they they do those little cartoons all the time and it's like this is how a buyer sees their house this is how a seller sees the house this is how an appraiser sees the house and this is how the tax assessor sees the house and normally in that thing the appraiser always gets the short end of the stick because they say we see a mansion like a shack well you want you want to try to convince them that yours is the worst on the block and so anything that you can say, you know, these are just the things that we know we need, you know, need doing and they are not yet done. So we are not like the, you know, those mark, those homes in the market that have been redone because a lot of what the sales that they are comparing to are show ready, sell ready homes, which means that all the things have generally been done. And if in your home, all the things have not been done at tax protest time, that's actually to your benefit. Okay, uh, here's a question here. I own a 10 year old house. I would like to know, does having carpet in the bedrooms affect the actual property value? Also, should I paint the interior of the whole house in order to sell it? So an appraiser will not typically go in and um, so we, we talk about personal preference and carpet is like a personal preference thing, right? In terms of bedrooms, you have people who absolutely love carpet in bedrooms. You have people who hate carpet in bedrooms because we live where we live, where to me, allergies are just the devil right now. Um, what we are finding more and more are homes that are solid surface flooring throughout. But that is not something that an appraiser would come out and say, I'm gonna give you a plus for all solid surfaces. I'm gonna give you a minus for all solid surfaces. Would an appraiser come in and um, when, when, when my house was built, there was carpet in the bathrooms. 
right? So that tells you how old it was, carpet in the bathrooms. Now an appraiser would come in right now, see carpet in the bathroom and know that you just had not done, you know, any trying to keep it current from like what, over 30 years ago, because we just don't do carpets and bathrooms anymore. But in terms of carpet and bedrooms, mm, as if it's good quality, good condition, clean it, and that's it. I, I wouldn't, um, I, I, I would not change that for the purpose of sale unless it were in poor condition. Um, in terms of painting, if you have um, bright colors, um, colors that would be difficult to paint, reds, um, dark colors, colors that would take several coats of primer in order to color and to change, then we would recommend painting it for the purpose of selling. Not that it's going to impact value. Hear me on that part. An appraiser is not going to come in and say that, you know, we're going to diminish your value, but a buyer may not be, you know, may come in and see the dollar signs needed to change that paint color. So what are what are some other things like that that's that people should be mindful of when it comes to when they're trying to sell their house? Like because I'm a realtor too and I've been out there before and I walk into these houses and I see these in my opinion god awful paint colors that are like bright lime green and just all kinds of stuff like you know you know to let me just be i'm gonna shoot straight the number one thing that a person can do to optimize the appeal of their home is the deepest deep cleaning you've ever done in the history of your life and and I and I say that because when as an appraiser, when we go in, we don't necessarily, and I'm, I'm gonna and I'm, I'm gonna say necessarily, we don't necessarily look at um, someone's housekeeping level, right? But if we see, I'm gonna say me. If I say I, I mean I gonna say we. If I see deep deep-seated, you know, grime, yuck, ick, right? Then my natural assumption is if you are not taking care of surface level things, there's no way you've taken care of deep level things. Mm -hmm. And if I, the appraiser with no skin in the game, with no emotional attachment to anything, I'm not getting ready to move in or move out. If I think like that, buyers for sure, think like that for sure think like that and so my you know my my first advice is always get it as clean as you can so you know where we're starting and then then that kind of gives you once you've gotten it as clean as it can possibly be in its current iteration it gives you an idea of okay what do i need to do now if you have scrubbed the appliances until they should gleam and they don't gleam, you may need to replace appliances. Mm. You know, um, we did, we should have, when we did the upstairs bath, we should have replaced the bathtub, but we didn't because this not talk about the why so I can stay in good relationship with my family, but we <laughs> did. And <laughs> what we did instead is the new thing with the bathtub refinishing because we had the porcelain cast iron tub. And what they do in the refinishing is they strip the, the porcelain and they like, well, I'd call it just painting. And I know that it's more than painting because it kills you like you can't even be in the house when they do it. I know that it's more than painting, but to me, the stuff chips, right? It doesn't, you can't clean it. It never feels like the tub is clean and it just, and so now that we're getting ready to do um, more on this second floor, I was like, so step one is we're just going to do a new tub. We're not refinishing. We're not wiping it off. We're not painting it again because using every industrial cleaner known to man, which you're not supposed to do after they do all of that stuff, but it just never feels clean. It never mm -hmm. feels clean. And so 
that then becomes a problem. If I can't get it clean or I can't get it to feel clean, then I need to replace it. I know you mentioned pools, but what about like uh, decks and current patios and things like that? Does that add any kind of value? So when we, when we do an appraisal, typically what we will do is we will talk about whether those things are present, right? Whether you have a patio or don't have a patio. For, for us to say, oh, this, provi this provides um, significant value, it would have to be something so far beyond. Um, even outdoor kitchens right now because one of the things in the market is you must be able to justify with data what you are saying adds value or doesn't add value. And the need for the justification with data and it's historical data. So even if I think that this adds value, if it's something that is common in the market, I should be able to prove that it does or doesn't add value. And so sometimes you have to say, if I went into if I went to buy this house and it, and it didn't have a deck, would I no longer buy the house? And if most of the market participants would say, well, this, one, this would impact whether I do or don't buy a house, it doesn't add value. When you think about things like bedroom count, right? People buy houses for the number of bedrooms. I have X amount of members in my family, or I want this many people to be able to stay over, you know, for whatever reason. So I need this many bedrooms. We absolutely apply value for bedrooms. Now I had an investor friend who had a home that he had been renting and he said, well, I'm trying to see if I can um, make some more money from the house. So I want to turn the dining room into another bedroom because then he'd be able to market it, you know, with an additional bedroom. And I said, well, you know, is there a breakfast room? Is there an eat-in kitchen? And he says, well, no, it doesn't have either of those. The only eating area is the dining room. And I was like, well, you can't get rid of the dining room then because people expect as much as they like a bedroom, they expect somewhere to eat, eat. you know? And so, you know, it's just, it's those kinds of things trying to think of, um, you know, we, we say that the bare minimum is to have a kitchen, a place where you can sit and congregate and a place where you can eat, you know? So we, we expect a kitchen, uh, a living or family room and a breakfast area or a dining room. And then go wild after that, but kind of make sure you have the basic things in order before you start moving walls, putting stuff in, taking things out, because you don't want to, you know, he said, well, we can take out a bathroom to make a dining room. Don't do that. Because <laughs> that bathroom adds value. You want to do things that make sense not just from what you are trying to make financially, but from how am I, you don't know if you're gonna have to sell that house. You know, yes, you may be able to rent it this year to that particular person you are attempting to rent to, but then what? You know, at the end of their lease, then what? It does the home remain marketable? And so that's kind of the thing that we want people to consider. Ms. Deborah, I see you unmuted yourself. Did you have a question? Okay, maybe that, maybe she hit it on accident or something. Okay, but since you were talking about bathrooms just now, um, what about removing the tubs from the bathrooms? So that's a big thing right now. You know, we're seeing homes where there is not a tub on the premises. And from an appraisal perspective, we count fixtures. Right. So, you know, to know whether it's a half bath, three quarter bath, full bath, we count fixtures. And so we would typically not make a um, a value change for the addition or the subtraction of a bathtub. But you want to think like a buyer. You know, is this an area where you typically have young professionals or childless couples? Then it may be fine to have a home with no bathtub. But if what you have is lots of families, you know, as a, as a, as a mom of six girls, I couldn't imagine a home with no bathtub because the two-year-old is just not ready for a shower. And so, um, you know, that, those are the things that you want to think about as you make changes. Gotcha. 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 I saw, 
uh, I can't remember the name of this store, but it's one of those stores that sells the patio stuff in the outdoor kitchens or what have you. They're making those now where you don't actually have to attach or adhere the outdoor kitchen to the actual house. Mm -hmm. So when people move, they literally pack up the outdoor kitchen and take it with them. So does that, does that, mm, let me see, does, I'm gonna to try to figure out how I'm gonna ask this question. If, since it is not, since it is not attached, we don't, it's personal property. It's personal property. Okay. It's personal so they property. Pack it up. Okay. We treat right. it like it's a washer and dryer. You know, we, we, um, uh, a, a, a range that is reasonably attached to the, to the counters, to the cabinets is real property. A range that floats in the middle of the kitchen is not because it is, you know, you could reasonably anticipate that the homeowner is going to put that on the back of the truck and take him, take Thank it with him. him. So anything that they could reasonably take it with them. But then you have some things we, we did an appraisal recently where this man had an auto lift in his house because he enjoyed working on cars. And because it is not bolted to the ground, it would have been treated like personal property, except it takes a crane to lift it. Mm. So, and he said it would cost as much to get them to move it as it would cost me to just get a new one, you know, where I'm going. Right. And so it now becomes uh, real property because it would take a significant amount of work to remove it from the property. That's how we look at it. Okay. All right. Well, once again, Miss Nikki, thank you very, very much for taking time out this afternoon. Um, for, for presenting all of this wonderful information. Uh, if you guys do have any questions in the meantime, uh, Ms. Nikki has provided her contact information. There are a couple of people that are only joining by phone that I see don't have a camera. So could you give your contact information aloud once again uh, for those that cannot see your contact? My cell phone number is 281-414-5709. Again, that's 281-414-5709. My email address is N like Nancy, V like Victor, C O L L I N S at K E Y S R E S dot com. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Well, good deal. Thank you again very much uh, for everybody for joining us for this afternoon. We hope that you found the information to be beneficial. And as stated before, uh, this session is being recorded and I will be emailing a link uh, of this session to everyone. In addition to the, uh, the home maintenance checklist that was provided by, uh, uh, by Brian, uh, our other presenter, uh, thank you, Ms. Grace. It was great to see your name pop up there. Um, and we thank all of you guys for, for continuing to support uh, a month of service. Um, at the end of this presentation on your pop-up screen, once you close or leave the meeting, you'll see a link for uh, a brief survey. Uh, we ask that you just take a couple of minutes to review that survey and answer those questions. We are in the process of planning our fall uh, meeting schedule. So uh, we'd like to receive your input. If there are other um, you know, asset building or asset protection type workshops that you guys are interested in or, or any other community uh, empowerment workshops that you guys may be interested in that we don't currently offer, then please uh, provide us with that feedback um, and let us know what you want to hear or, or what, what information that you need. So we'll be happy to try to and get that provided for you guys. So, but in the meantime, uh, thank you guys once again. Um, ask that you continue to take care of yourselves, stay safe, um, and we hope to see you back again at uh, future month of service presentations. So uh, thank you, Ms. Ariane, um, Ms. Mr. Gomez, uh, Ms. Lynn. Um, since we used to be in the community uh, doing this, we don't we don't get to see faces uh, anymore like we used to, uh, but we see those names that continue to pop up. Ms. Lynn, thank you very much. Ms. Deborah, we appreciate you uh, once again for, uh, for coming out and participating. So you guys have a wonderful afternoon. Uh, Ms. Collins, thank you again. Uh, and we will see you guys next time. Have a wonderful afternoon.